Hello and welcome back to the Studio Canal Presents podcast. My name is Simon Brew from Film Stories magazine and this is a new monthly podcast celebrating one of the biggest and deepest film libraries in the world. Studio Canal's catalogue of films and the full list nearly crashed my computer brings together cinema from around the globe going back over 100 years. The full library is over 6,000 titles strong. It includes everything from French New Wave favourites, Breathless and Last Year at Marion Bad, to Haunting Horrors Don't Look Now and The Others, plus decades worth of brilliant British comedy from Vintage Ealing and Carry Ons to modern classics like Four Lions and Alan Partridge Alpha Papa. And we're going to do our best to explore it all in this podcast. Every episode, I'm joined by a special guest for a deep dive into our film choice of that month. And along the way, we flag up new releases, re-releases, films you might have seen, films you might not have seen, and hopefully add a movie or two to your watch list as we go. Over the next couple of episodes, we're going to be taking a look at the classic Graham Greene adaptation, The Third Man, and digging into the cinematic oeuvre of the one and only Arnold Schwarzenegger. You ready? We'll be back with that one. But this month we wanted to devote the show to perhaps the greatest British children's film of all time, The Railway Children, ahead of the release in UK cinemas of its brand new sequel, The Railway Children Return. Someone in hideout, soldier or spy. He's in there. Stay back. Are you German? No, I'm on your side. I'm Abe. I can't talk about it, but I'm on a secret mission. If you tell anyone, you're putting me and yourselves in danger. What if the captures hide in him? We can't give him up. <laughs> that, then, is a clip from The Railway Children Return, which hits UK cinemas on Friday the 15th of July. Now, we're going to be hearing more about that film later in this episode, but first we wanted to rewind 52 years to the movie that started it all. So we're about to go deep on the original The Railway Children. And if you haven't seen it yet, you might want to pause here and head over to the Studio Canal Presents channel on Apple TV, where you can stream the movie right now. But don't worry, either way, we're going to steer clear of major spoilers. And as soon as we started discussing The Railway Children, we knew there was only one person we should speak to. Composer, writer, presenter, silent film pianist, and Railway Children mega fan, Neil Brand. Neil Brand, (laughs) welcome to the podcast. Thanks very much, Simon. So, Neil, if my research is correct, you were around 12 years old when the Railway Children first came out. Yep. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about when you first heard about it and why it had such an impact on you. I think I first came across it because in advance of the release, as a lot of family films did at the time, they were letting out little clips and little moments and stuff onto other children's TV programs. And I can't remember if it was Clapperboard, which was the big ITV film program for kids, yeah. or Screen Test, which was the big BBC one. But they were talking about the music. And it's the moment where they first meet Perks on the station platform. And he runs round to open the gates for the Scotch Express. And you get this kind of ding, 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 sort of music for him running, like sort of jangly piano. And he opens up the gates, and then this train comes through. This is it! The Scots Flyer! You hear bagpipes as the train goes by. (laughs) So I was living in Burgess Hill at the time, just north of Brighton, and I went with my mum and dad to Brighton to see it in one of the great big mega cinemas that was still around in 1971. It was before they started carving them up into smaller screens. And it pretty much rewrote my head. I know that sounds a ridiculous thing to say about a children's film from that period with that subject matter to it, but it's absolutely true. It really made me rethink a bit about my growing up aside from you know the sort of the edwardianness the trains jenny agatha cribbins everything that was great about the film anyway it actually got quite deep to me on a whole other level are you a firm believer in the idea of you watch a certain film at a certain point in your life then and that sort of changes your compass a little bit was that what this film was for you yeah totally I should fill in a little bit of context. I grew up in a fairly strict, not massively strict, but a fairly strict Methodist house. So Sundays were given over to church almost entirely. 
and we didn't do an awful lot of getting out or going around much. We were fairly insular. We stayed home. We read books. And going to the cinema was a big old treat anyway. So by the time I was 12 and I was starting to kind of like wanting to break out of this a little bit, has to be said, going and seeing this film at that point was the first time it had occurred to me. Because in my house, we we hardly ever argued. In fact, we didn't argue because arguments got shut down straight away. So there was very little of that kind of family, slightly bruising stuff going on that happens I think in normal families, in our family, we were a little bit kind of, you know, well, I want to say something about this, but I can't. And actually, the film was about kids discovering that adults weren't always in charge of their own lives. Yeah. And that really came home in a big way to me, because I've been brought up to think, well, adults have got it sorted. All the authority figures... Doctors, teachers, policemen, etc. You know, we paid complete lip service to all of that. So the idea somehow or other that a kid could start having things go wrong in their lives. And I love the way that the railway children delineates things going wrong. So first of all, the little engine that he's given by his dad blows up. The dog runs out. Within five minutes of the beginning of the film, they never see the dog again. It's like Bambi's mum, you know, it's like, a, what? Where, where, where's the dog? We're only five minutes in, so straight away you're being prepared for catastrophic stuff. You even brute! And that was the last we saw of poor Potts. Everything just goes wronger and wronger and wronger. They, they lose all the staff, they lose all their money, they have to get out, they have to move somewhere else. I suppose in a way... Because it's really well structured in the first place by E. Nesbitt, everything going wrong is replaced by things being more right than they could possibly know by moving up to this nirvana in the north with these wonderful trains and beautiful sunny days and absolutely no smoke whatsoever in spite of the fact they're near Keithley, which at the time <laughs> must have been one of the most poisonous airs in the world because it was a heavy industrial town. You don't get any of that. And from then on through, that slow realisation of actually what has happened, and like you say, we don't want to give away any spoilers, but... When Bobby, particularly when the Jenny Agatha character, is then put in a position of knowing secret knowledge that she can't tell the other kids. Yeah. Well, for me at the age of 12, this was growing up fast, seriously. I mean, more so even than, you know, catching the odd bit of lady's bosom in carry-on or something like that. This was, this was realising there was a whole subtext out there to do with adults that had never occurred to me before. You all think that we ought to have been very happy, and we were, but we did not know how happy, till the pretty life at Edgecombe Villa was over and done with, and we had to live a very different life indeed. This wasn't just a whole new world for you either. This was a whole new world for Lionel Jeffries, the writer and director of the Railway Children adaptation. Yeah. His background at the time was unusual for someone making the jump into directing. I think mm. it's a more common path now that someone goes from acting to directing. But can you give us a little bit of his story and what led him to make the film? He'd made a big name for himself as an actor. Yeah. The biggest thing he did in terms of visibility was that he'd played the granddad in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang in 1966 and everybody had been to see Chitty Chitty Bang Bang everybody knew Lionel everybody knew Port out starboard home posh with a capital P it's all you know he's there 100% Lionel and it's an interesting one because EMI at the time the film company that made the railway children was being run by an actor called Brian Forbes who had made the change from acting, and he'd had a very big career as well, he'd done huge things, to directing, and then eventually to, to running a studio. He became a studio head. Mm. And Lionel Jeffries said, look, I want to do this. This is my project. Don't you let anybody else direct it. I know exactly how to do it. Brian Forbes basically said, yes, okay, off you go. Obviously, he had a big group of either studio or ex-studio techies behind him who knew what they were doing. So the editor was Teddy Darvis. Teddy Darvis was one of the greatest editors in British film. Like so many of the backroom boys, hardly ever acknowledged. Yeah. But Teddy really knew what he was doing. 
And his DP, can't remember who that was, but he basically surrounded himself with people who absolutely knew their job. That was Arthur Ibbotson, wasn't it? I think shot the film. Arthur Ibbotson. There you go. Blimey. Couldn't get a bigger name than that. So when it came to actually making the film, Jeffries made a conscious decision that it was going to be cinematic. So in other words, it wasn't just going to be a case of training up the kids to look as realistic as possible. He was going to use every trick in the book. And if you watch the most famous sequence, the daddy, my daddy sequence, the thing about it is that it's got every visual trick in the book, aside from the sound. So visually, you see the train start to move off. You see it slightly going to slow motion. You see Jenny Agatha slightly blurred. You see the smoke. The, the real sound drifts away and you start to get the piano playing this little ding, 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 ding in the background. So it's like we're going to Bobby's head, but brilliantly done. I mean, really, really well done. Then back to the smoke, then back to her. Then the smoke just clears enough that we can see it's her dad's face. Then she starts to run, and she runs in slow motion, and her daddy, my daddy, is in echo. Daddy, my daddy! Until eventually she gets to him, they hug, they pull back, and there's a still of them. And I haven't even mentioned the different lenses. There's about four different lenses in that moment alone. Interesting. So that the whole thing has been incredibly intricately put together by real film professionals. The final shot of the dad, you can see right the way down the line behind him. But he is absolutely in focus. It's an incredible piece of deep focus shooting. It's not just the emotional punch of Daddy My Daddy. It's the way that punch has been given so much cinematic space in which to do its job. No wonder we all came out weeping out of that. I mean, blimey, it's, it's incredibly manipulative. And yet done in such a way that it's not going me, 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 me. Which there are filmmakers working today, who I won't name, who you can't watch one of their films without every now and then them popping up, as it were, going, hey, look at this amazing shot I've just given you. <laughs> and this is the exact opposite of that. So I think Lionel Jeffries did a phenomenal job with that film and then went on, of course, to make um, Amazing Mr. Blunden and The Wombles. Yeah. For me, he just never did anything quite as impressive as that again. I remember reading a book by Nicholas Heitner talking primarily about when he was running the National Theatre, but then he also talked about making the jump from theatre to cinema with The Madness of King George. Mm. He notes in that book he made his very best film when he knew the absolute least about filmmaking. <laughs> and I just wonder if there's something of that here. I think there is. Lionel Jeffrey's main ambition with the film was to get the kids as watchable and as believable as possible. Yeah. He hires Bernard Cribbins. Blimey. Bernard Cribbins and Lionel Jeffries had come up through comedy royalty together, virtually. They are the wrong arm of the law if you take Peter Sellers out <laughs> of it, right? Yeah. So the two of them know each other backwards. They know exactly what they're going to do next. Lionel Jeffries makes things as easy as possible dealing with the adults so that the kids get all the screen time they need. And lovely, charming moments like Bobby's birthday. Oh, my God. <laughs> So when Bobby has a birthday, she hasn't been told. They've all they've all been saying, "What have you got? Oh, I don't know about your birthday." And she's rather disappointed. And then her mum says, "All right, come on in for dinner and put your best bow on, or whatever." And she can't understand why she's got to put on her best bow. Walks into the room, and the music comes up, and the music is staggeringly good. Johnny Douglas, another absolutely unsung hero of film music, as far as I'm concerned. And instead of walking around the room to get all her presents and her cards from these people who love her so much, which you can tell, Lionel Jeffries puts her on a platform with the camera and they push the platform around the room. So she literally floats. And that was just genius. Now, Okay, there's no way that anybody would have said, I don't think anyway, here, Lionel, if you want to make this work, stick her on a platform with the camera. I'm sure that's that's Lionel Jeffries going, I know exactly how this feels. This is, this is a young girl's major moment in her life. So she will feel like she's just floating, like a ballet dancer around these people. 
it's extraordinarily well directed, both in terms of its cinematic side of things and the direction of the actors. But I would have been surprised if he hadn't been able to do a really good job with the actors. He knew exactly what he was doing. He'd made so many films by then. I came to the Railway Children relatively recently, and there was one moment quite early in the film that really just took me aback. And it's a moment where a child is struck. And yeah. it's really arresting now. But also what you were talking about, the construction and the build-up to certain scenes, the yeah. build-up to that moment could have come out of Hitchcock's Psycho. <laughs> the way the music is used, the way the yeah. cuts are used. And then I, I just thought it was going to pull back, but it doesn't pull back. And I wonder <laughs> if you can talk to little moments like that as well, because there's real actual peril here. There's yeah. real danger. Well, again, this is another thing. You kind of had to grow up with that sort of world. Kids got smacked around the head all the time, and it didn't take much, to be absolutely frank. <laughs> I can remember going to the cinema when I was younger and sitting there with a couple of mates and sort of you know, chatting away. And behind every now and then, someone behind you would go lean around just clip you around the ear. You're like, shut up! Right. And it was like, you know, nowadays we would just think that was grounds for common assault. You know, you'd go out and get a policeman and say, oh, this bloke just hit me. Yeah. But it was like all kids were open season for all adults if those adults saw those kids doing anything in, even remotely transgressive. And I like the fact that in the film, it doesn't pull its punches. If it did, it would be very hard to take. You know, this isn't Little House on the Prairie. This isn't Heidi. Actually, strip away the veneer, particularly the class veneer that you would have in Edwardian England. And that servant woman you can just tell, has been itching to get her hands on this little sod and the things that he's said and the things he's done to her. And finally, she done, in a way, the film's actually set up that she's fairly justified. I can't remember what he's done. He's soaked her with water or something like it's that. It's the bucket of water on the door, isn't it? That's right, it's water over the door. And as you say, you get this shot of her looking at the camera with absolute loathing and walking towards him with one hand up. It felt absolutely real. No! You nasty no, little no, limb, you. you! The other thing you need to be aware of, for my lot growing up around that time, there was really only one place you got your children's films from, and that was Disney. Yeah. And Disney was in the job of providing fantasy. And all the adults in Disney films are either out-and-out -out villains or they're so lovely and they're so nice to their children. The children are all so nice and everybody says, Ugh. whereas the British who had given the world hammer horror, let's not forget, in the 1950s, which had basically woken everybody up from a kind of sleep where horror films were concerned, could do the same thing with children's films by basically going, yeah, if you grew up in any kind of working class or middle class house, this is how it worked, and this is how it still works. My sense of jeopardy was, what if Peter got caught nicking that coal? Just the thought of what could come down on their heads. Yeah. And that horrendous business where they get everybody to give presents to Perks because it's his birthday and Perks thinks they've just been charitable. I remember just feeling writhing with embarrassment at that, at what that could mean and how destructive it could be to this amazing relationship they had with Perks. I'd forgotten to put the labels on any of the things. You won't know what's from who. You'll think it's all from us and that we're trying to be grand and... Charitable or something horrid like that. So again, I think, again, this is down to Lionel. This is down to really good, well thought through direction and allowing the the kids to show that, you know, say kids, Sally Thompson was old enough to have a sports car when she made that film. <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, we, we've got a bit of Michael J. Fox in Back to the Future sequels going on here with the, with the ages of yeah, the kids, have. haven't we? Yeah, brother. How many O-levels did they have between them when they were playing these um, It was these it, it was quite a few. And, uh, you know, that's the sort of thing you leave your preconceptions at the door as soon as you see that. I mean, blimey, we all went and watched Grease. John Travolta must have stayed at school for about 20 years in order to be able to be that old. <laughs> so, I mean, I think it was a revelation. And it's no, ex I mean, I'm a bit of an old railway fan. It's no exaggeration to say that actually it put steam railways on the map. I don't think people knew you could go and travel on a steam train. And it really upped the number of people who went to see the, the, the Keith Lee and Worth Valley, where they'd shot it, but also the Blue Mile Railway and the Yorkshire and the rest of them, West Somerset, all 
suddenly they got much more interest. I don't care, I won't stand it, I tell you straight. But it's them children you make such a fuss about. The children from the three children. I don't care, not if it was angels from heaven. I'm not sure we as a species necessarily deserve Bernard Cribbins. <laughs> and I look at him in something more modern like Doctor Who, where he completely broke my heart in that. Yeah. <laughs> my favourite sequence in The Railway Children, you touched on it before, is Perks's birthday. Yeah. The character of Perks in that is extraordinary and the writing in that scene is extraordinary. The more I think about it, the layers of things going on in that, that a simple act of kindness could be so misconstrued in an understandable way. So I open this up, really. I mean, please tell us how brilliant Bernard Cribbins is and then I will agree with you at the end. I think if we if we structure it like that, that's probably the simplest way to do it, isn't it? He is. And that sense of potential destruction of such a valuable relationship again it was something else i've probably not seen before but the idea that somehow or other friendships were vulnerable and you just knew they knew that perks was going to be livid if he found this out he's a tough working class bloke who's had to get where he's got by sheer hard work and grit and you see the other side of him i'm sure that's why he was cast when he thinks the kids have been treating him like some kind of charity case, the way that the steel shutter comes down and he just sits there, you know, really, he could play cold, he could play nasty when he wanted to. But again, it's a class thing. And E. Nesbitt didn't shy away from this. This happened and in most of her novels. There is an element of class clash, even if we're with, as it were, the upper class. And there's no two ways about it. These kids... They're upper middle class. Their dad probably was you know, very, very well off when he was born. He's been to university. He's high up in the government. So up until the moment they go to Yorkshire, their life has been pretty idyllic, and they know that. And then it turns out that it needs someone working class, who normally they probably wouldn't give the time of day to, like Perks, to turn that around. I've also got mentioned the end of that whole scene, it's Perks and his wife in bed. They wear a lot of clothes in that bed. Because it's Deddy Davis, isn't it, as, as Nell? Who's Deddy like, Davis, thank you, Deddy Davis, yes. They've got so many covers on and so many clothes. I don't know how they sleep. Yeah, but don't forget, this is a cottage in the north made of stone with no heating in it. So I should imagine those beds were freezing, even on a summer night. And there's a brilliant thing where they pull the, they pull the curtains across. The curtains are a bit unexpected, I have to say. And then you hear from the other side, oh, go on then. And he pops his head out, picks up a bottle, gets the cork out of his mouth and blows the cork across the room. And what she's allowed him to do is take his beer to bed with him. That is so Lionel Jeffries, so Bernard Cribbins. And I bet you they work that up themselves as well. Because it's a f perfect end to the day. The best birthday present that Daddy Davis could give Bernard Cribbins was to let him have a drink in bed. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, he was sweaty. He needed a drink. <laughs> Lord knows I was ever better pleased. Not so much with the presents, though, frankly, the RNA one collection, but the kind respect of our neighbours. That's worth having, I know. I think it's all worth having. And you've made a most ridiculous fuss about nothing, Bert, if you ask me. No, I haven't. If a man didn't respect himself, nobody wouldn't do it for him. So, Neil, you've also been thinking about another Studio Canal film that has quite a few connections to the Railway Children, and one that's recently turned up in the Queen's uh, Platinum Jubilee as well, <laughs> Paddington. <laughs> yeah. Again, you say what you're going to say, and I'm going to agree with you at the end of this. Can you tell us what's so special to you about Paddington and why you feel it's it's in the same world, really, as The Railway Children? For me, the first Paddington film, it was fine. Paddington 2 was a revelation. The humour that came out of Paddington 2, because you were headed off down a side street, you had no idea where you were going. And to take the ambitious step of actually sticking Paddington in prison was genius. Good morning. How would you like to start a gardening club? How would you like to be buried in a very deep hole? This is the great idea about reinventing when it comes to adaptation. Paddington in the books can fit in anywhere. So what do you do to really make us care? You put him in somewhere he cannot fit in. And you make him fit in in a way that changes that environment entirely. So the entire prison eventually being painted pink <laughs> and full of lovely prisoners who make cakes. 
but over what appeared to be almost insuperable odds and genuine violence just waiting round the corner to be visited on the smallest, most vulnerable, most gorgeous bear in the whole world, just drew you right in and hooked you, even more so than the train sequence that happened at the end. And the real star of it, of course, you know, is Hugh Grant. Hugh Grant took the living pee out of his own acting and out of the acting of other people as well. <laughs> Indeed, Magwitch. And we gave quite a performance, you and I. The people behind the film, well worth bearing in mind that Simon Farnaby from Horrible Histories is one of the writers. And that humour of Hugh Grant getting into St Paul's Cathedral and then being able to escape after having been dressed as a nun and Simon Farnaby playing the character of a security man in St Paul's Cathedral who's fallen in love with this incredibly good-looking nun. As he escapes coming down the stairs, he turns the nun's habit round and turns around and he's become the Archbishop of Canterbury. But for those of us who know Justin Welby, the Archbishop of Canterbury, <laughs> Hugh Grant suddenly is Justin Welby. Not just any old Archbishop of Canterbury, it's the one we recognise off the telly. Oh, uh, good evening, Your Grace. Good evening. This is entirely inclusive comedy. It's the thing that you mentioned about Cribbins that he's so good at. Comedy that anybody can see is intended to make you laugh. It's not just for a particular tribe to laugh at or a particular age group. It's for everybody. And I thought it was great that Paddington went and saw the Queen. I thought it was particularly good that of all the things that would bring the Queen's lighter side out, it could be an animated bear. <laughs> British cinema, what can I tell you? There is absolutely no way the Americans could have made that film or indeed made it in the way that, the, that it was made. So I think it bears a lot of comparison, ho ho, pun intended. I see what you did there with the railway children because of that, and because of the inclusivity of its comedy and of its story in general. Thank you, thank you. Well, it seems I didn't need the West End after all. Just a captive audience. Neil, before you head off every episode, one thing I like to ask of our guests as well is to help me dive even deeper into the Studio Canal Library by suggesting a dream double bill from the thousands of films in the catalogue. And mm. you're sticking with the 1970s for your picks. Is that right? Well, I am in this particular instance. I went to see another film only a couple of years after Railway Children for what would turn out to be very obvious reasons as soon as you know the title. It's Trains, isn't it, Neil? It's Trains, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's Murder on the Orient Express. It's the original Murder on the Orient Express. Two things about that. I mean, one is that I still think it's the greatest Agatha Christie adaptation ever. And I loved the... It was the first time they'd put together an all-star cast. Before then, all-star had normally meant three or four reasonably big stars and then five people you'd never heard of. Well, all of the suspects in Murder on the Orient Express, and there's something like 12 of them, are played by named starry actors, huge names, people like Sean Connery. Which was probably just as well, because the film was actually entirely made in one carriage. <laughs> or possibly two. The other thing that made it for me was the music, which was the truly great, legendary, as far as I'm concerned, Richard Rodney Bennett. He just invented something with uh, Murder on the Orient Express. Not only did he put us all in a wonderful space where evil could flourish... ...but he also, and most famously, made the train dance. He set a waltz under the train as it pulled away from the station in Ankara. This waltz went from a slow, ponderous start as the wheels began to move to this fantastic kind of sweeping waltz in which you felt the jeopardy of what was to happen. You felt the sense of things going wrong. You felt this wonderful sense of luxury. It's like the luxury of the train was somehow or other in the lushness of the music. All of us train nuts just went, oh, wow, there's someone else who gets it. <laughs> but that was a great film as far as I was concerned. And I also have to say, I put my hand on my heart. I thought Branner didn't even get close. So for my money, the original uh, Murder on the Orient Express knocks the second one into a cocked hat. In fact, don't even bother going to see the second one. <laughs> this one is the one. And what would you pair Murder on the Orient Express with? 
Is it more trains? It's not more trains. No, in fact, I don't think you even see a train in this one, which is surprising given that it's a Sherlock Holmes film and it's set in, in London in the 1880s. This is Murder by Decree. Now, I think this was originally made for TV. There was some very weird reason why it only had, from what I can gather, a fairly small release in the cinema. But it takes the facts of the Jack the Ripper murders, which were obviously horrible, and it sets Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson on the trail of the Ripper with an explanation, which possibly still is, held to be the reason why Jack the Ripper was the man that he was and why we never found out anything more about him. Well, old chap, what shall we do? Shall we take up the chase? We don't see that we have any choice. They've put their trust in you. Good, honest fellows. Holmes and Watson are played by Christopher Plummer and James Mason, and they are a superb double act. James Mason easily gives as good as he gets. There's a lot of real genuine violence... I think it's a 15, it may even be an 18. It doesn't stint on the Ripper murders, or indeed on the kind of febrile atmosphere of London at the time. It's full of sex and death and prostitutes. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson plunge into the Victorian underworld, seeking the answers to the most puzzling case in the annals of crime. Who is Jack the Ripper? And it's very much of its time in that it takes a 1970s view, a post-60s view, if you like, of the Ripper murders and of Holmes and of London. So this is not Arthur Conan Doyle's Holmes. This is a man who's used to dealing with the nasty side of life. He's more like one of those kind of tired old PIs in American films, like in film noir. He's sort of seen it all. And yet, even so, is being presented with stuff that he could never have you know, expected to see. And you've got streets at night, you've got mysterious coachmen, you've got horrible murders, you've got the lot, and you've got Holmes and Watson thrown in, and you've got this wonderful big twist about who Jack the Ripper actually was and why he was making these horrendous murders that he was. And it's all tied in with the Masons and royalty and daring do and misbegotten deeds in upper classes and it's fab murder by decree and bob clark who directed that would go on to do porkies two films later is there, is there any <laughs> is there any through line to that at all because that seems like quite a leap to me and uh, no. <laughs> i did see porkies <laughs> and I think I paid money to go and see it in the cinema because of the promise of illicit sex, in which there was none whatsoever. We were all misled. It didn't have on the Porky's poster from the director of Murder by Decree. No, funnily enough, it didn't. It's an but oversight, no. isn't it? It's <laughs> it really is. Neil Brand, this has been an absolute delight. Thank you very much for your time, and uh, I hopefully see you on a train platform soon. I look forward to it. Thanks a lot, Simon. So, if you haven't seen it, or if hearing all of that has made you want to watch it again, then you can stream The Railway Children on the Studio Canal Presents channel on Apple TV right now. And in a bit of breaking news, Studio Canal Presents is also now available on Prime Video as well. And if you'd like to catch up with Neil's double bill, you can find Murder on the Orient Express on the Studio Canal Presents channel too, as well as DVD and Blu-ray. Murder by Decree is on DVD and Blu-ray. Now it's time for our regular section of the show where we flag up one or two releases to put on your radar. And we've got a big new release for you this episode, the incoming cinematic treat, The Railway Children Return. And I spoke to its director, Morgan Matthews, who told me all about it. Come on! We want your help. It's classified information. It's more than my life's worth. What are they doing? Bobby well, we should know. You think Phyllis wasn't forever telling me about your childhood antics? Not antics, action. Can you perhaps start by telling us how The Railway Children Return came into your life and what your memories of the original film were? Well, I was sent the script and uh, I really warmed to it. And I liked the fact that it was grounded in history as well. But it was also sent to me at a time, it was relatively early on in the pandemic. At that time, when we weren't able to visit our loved ones and we were separated from family members. And that was really quite difficult personally and for obviously millions of people around the country. And 
it sort of invited me to reflect, I suppose, on that time in World War II when children were sent away, evacuated to the countryside, and their parents had to leave them on the platform, or usually their mothers, put them on the trains and said goodbye to them. And um, I went through some old archive, looked at the photos, and seeing the faces of some of those children in, in the photos, it sort of reminded me of my own children. And I found that very powerful. And it also has that in common with the original, yeah. because the children, they were separated from their father and went to stay somewhere new in the countryside and had to meet new people, new friends, and, and start a new life there. So I think the sort of connection to the original felt genuine, but also moving the story on. And then now it feels even more relevant. And it's quite difficult to watch the opening scene in the film where the children are sent away on the train without thinking of what's happening in Ukraine. And certainly just a few weeks ago, the scenes that, that we were seeing in Ukraine and family separation in present day wartime. I don't want to go. You need to get away from this war. Come here, come on. I sat and watched the railway children return with my own children and their fans, if you're after poster quotes. And one of the things in their eyes that I saw really is you don't shy away from the threats and the backdrop that the youngsters find themselves in in your film. Not in a terrifying way, but you're not resisting the depth of the conversation. Absolutely. And, and I think particularly for children as well. I don't think it's good practice to talk down to children. Children always know when they're, when they're being talked down to. And as much as we try and protect children, they are very aware, you know, particularly during wartime as well. So I think it's important to represent that and to represent that in a way that feels uh, realistic to the time with children that would have experienced things and, and have had to grow up in a different way. It's also a fun and lively film, we found. And, I mean, to mangle a popular cliché, never work with young performers and trains. <laughs> Can you tell us your experience of making this film and working with young performers and trains? From my experience, that is absolutely untrue. And <laughs> I think the opposite, uh, genuinely. I love working with the children. I've worked with young actors before. A couple of the kids hadn't done anything before, a couple had done quite a bit or been in some big films, but not necessarily in leading roles. So they had different levels of experience, but they joined together and brought this great energy and they genuinely bonded as a group. And they spent a lot of time together because they were bubbled in this hotel location that was quite out in the middle of nowhere in Yorkshire. So they, they spent a lot of time together and it was a lot of fun because they would come up with little improvised lines. And for me, it's very important that the kids feel relaxed when they're working, when they're acting, and that they can throw little things in because I'm looking for the most naturalistic performance always. And I think particularly with kids, it helps for them to feel kind of relaxed and to be able to do that kind of thing. And sometimes things work and sometimes they don't. And that's OK, but we can have fun. And I think that sense of fun, I hope that sense of fun really comes through in, in the film as well, and that sense of them as, as individuals and as a group. Do you remember our life in here? Oh, quiet! This is oh, quiet! Like it was yesterday. It is an enormous train set as well, though, of course. Yes, the trains. And, <laughs> and actually, Noel um, from uh, Keithley Worth Valley Railway, which is the sort of enthusiast-run railway that provided all of the trains and the tracks. One of the things that gave me great confidence, the first recce, I went up to Yorkshire and, and looked at the trains and I just thought, whatever the budget film you're making, you couldn't get better trains to work with or better people to run them. And uh, some of the trains were in the original film or some of the trains that they have were in the original film, the Lionel Jackson. Is that right? Film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're perfectly preserved and they're just beautiful pieces of engineering. They really are. I was a bit concerned, if we're shooting on a train, I want the train to be moving. I don't want to green screen the background and that kind of thing. I want to be shooting on a moving train and have that sense, real sense of movement and real trees going past the window. And uh, I was a bit concerned about the time it would take to, to reset the trains and that sort of thing. And Noel said to me, we'll be ready before you are. <laughs> <laughs> 
and generally they were and I'm uh, quite surprised by how quickly you can reverse a train or uh, how quickly they can reverse a train out of the station and bring it back and all of that sort of thing so they're pretty speedy and they're very good at what they do they made life a lot easier for us one more question i mean can you exclusively give us news about a third film now because if i'm following it right if we go with batman naming parlance uh the next one should be what the railway children forever and then the railway children and robin do you want to drop us an exclusive here <laughs> um i don't have an exclusive to drop um but uh, <laughs> you know that's a good idea maybe we'll maybe we'll run with that i suppose it depends how this one goes down excellent Morgan Matthews, director of The Railway Children Return, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. I'm Bobby. I'm Lily. Patty. Ted. So I know what you must be feeling. <laughs> Look at all the stars you can see. It's scary. It's not scary. It's the countryside. And finally, as we promised last episode, a bit more on those upcoming Doctor Who re-releases. Studio Canal has just released its remaster of the Peter Cushing headline Doctor Who and the Daleks as a 4K UHD collector's edition Blu-ray and on digital platforms. And it's following that with Daleks Invasion Earth 2150 AD, which is arriving on July the 18th. This is 2150 AD, the year when human beings are turned into living dead men, robo-men, the underground slaves of the world's new dictators. If you want to see them both on the big screen too, double bill screenings are taking place in UK cinemas from July the 10th, 2022. All of these are very much in my interests as a 4K disc nerd and as a Doctor Who nerd. I've been pleased to see already that the early reviews for the transfers have been so positive for these, and the whole thing also gives me a chance to talk to you about Doctor Who. Attention, resist, and you will be there have been many attempts to bring a version of Doctor Who to the big screen over the years. Harry Potter director David Yates was linked at one stage. And yet the only movies to have made it so far date all the way back to the 1960s and these two particular features. The person we've got to thank for them, well, if you go back to the heart of them, it's an American writer and producer by the name of Milton Sabotsky. Now, he was already very tuned into British culture in the early 1960s, thanks to the impact of the likes of the Beatles. And he soon became aware of Doctor Who, and in particular, the Doctor's most famous nemesis, the Daleks. The Daleks made their debut on television in November 1963, and they were a very quick success too. the creation of Terry Nation, who was looking for a foe that wasn't just someone in a suit. Here's a bit of trivia for you as well. Ridley Scott had initially been set to design the Daleks, but he left the BBC just before work on that particular story began. Dalek mania nonetheless soon hit, and Sabotsky swept in, picking up an option to make up to three films of Doctor Who and the Daleks. He paid hundreds of pounds for the privilege. Can you imagine what the price tag would be today? Sabotsky had just come off working with Peter Cushing on the anthology film Doctor Terror's House of Horrors, which was released in 1964. And after promptly renaming the title character Doctor Who, he signed Cushing up for the role. The first film, Doctor Who and the Daleks, would open at the same time in the UK as a little-known family movie by the name of Mary Poppins, and it would be a top 20 box office hit come the end of the year. Ironically, in the US, and it was the US market that Sabotsky was targeting, the film struggled more, but in the UK, it was a success. So much so that it was straight on to film number two. More money was pumped into the next movie, Daleks Invasion Earth 2150 AD. And this time, in a cunning link to the rest of this episode, because here comes that name again, the mighty Bernard Cribbins was added to the cast. Bernard Cribbins, a reluctant traveller into the dangerous future. Have you seen the girl? Listen, where's the girl? Circumstances ultimately worked against the third film in the series happening, but what a delight to see the two movies we got and looking better than ever as well. And please rest assured, I'll try and squeeze Doctor Who back into future episodes of this podcast too. Subjected to cosmic rays, savagely invaded by men of steel who have no flesh to pierce, no blood to spill. And that's it for this episode of Studio Canal Presents. Next time, we'll be joined by Orson Welles fanatic Anna Bogatskaya for that deep dive into the film that's been called the greatest British movie of all time, The Third Man. 
In the meantime, to find out more about Studio Canal Films, you can visit www.studiocanal.co.uk or follow Studio Canal at Studio Canal UK on Twitter, Instagram and TikTok. And if I don't see you at the cinema for The Railway Children Returns in the meantime, I'll see you back here next month for the next episode of Studio Canal Presents. Ta-ta for now.